Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Douglas Cole. How are you doing, Douglas? I'm doing very well. Nice to meet you. And what part of the world are you in today? I I'm in Toronto, Canada. Toronto, Canada. Excellent. And what we're going to talk about today is um, Douglas's book, um, which was published in July, actually. And Douglas is a sales leader, at LinkedIn and advisor with startup accelerators in North America and part time university lecturer. Uh, and sounds like you have no spare time because it seems like a lot, lot going on in your life there. <laughs> uh, and we're going to talk about we're going to talk about the book, The Sales MBA, How to Influence corporate buyers um so let's just get straight into it douglas just tell me first of all just briefly kind of the genesis of this book and, and why you decided to write it yeah i i feel that this book emerged quite organically i joined uh, linkedin about five years ago and uh, when i joined linkedin i became quite obsessed with the craft of sales uh, becoming a practitioner and a leader in sales and uh, in the course of my learning journey, I developed a, a mini MBA for sales for the global sales team. Um, I was trying to do, I was trying to marry my previous career, which is which was in consulting with my newfound career in sales. And I was trying to bring right. these two worlds together by uh, introducing principles of business acumen and the like that I felt were of value to the global sales team. So in the course of building this program, uh, the mini MBA for sales, I was getting a lot of feedback from, from, the, different, from the global sellers on the different modules. And over the course of that journey, I realized that this had to be turned into a book. Someone at some point gave mm -hmm. me the advice about book writing. Someone said, you know, you need to understand it, it needs to be more painful not to write a book than to write mm -hmm. it because it's a very, very arduous journey. And unless it's actually going to cause you more pain not to undertake that journey, don't bother. Uh, but I did get to the point where I felt I had to do it. And in fact, I took three months off work just so I could write it. And uh, so it was the organic uh it was something that emerged organically from that uh, that course development process. Yeah, um, it's fantastic. And and if we start off, I mean, you have your part. One of your book is all about be, becoming a strategist. And yeah, to some salespeople, you know, that might sound. Hmm, what do you mean by a strategist? Um, that sounds a little highbrow. I mean, they say, yeah, you know, we strategize on our accounts, but a strategist. Yeah. So when you say becoming a strategist, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean. And maybe to answer that question, I should just give a little bit of context for the just in terms of the structure of the book because everything comes yep. together. And you know, basically, what I'm arguing, and I agree with what you said just now, which does it does sound like a somewhat for salespeople, but that's mm -hmm. much part of my intention here. I, I do believe that there is a lot of sophistication in the craft of selling, and what I'm trying to do is elevate the profession. I'm trying to dignify yep. the discipline of sales by using a weightier you know, labels, uh, more uh, slightly more serious labels for what it is that we do in this profession. And um, so I believe that people who do this stuff really well, they, uh, and I'm talking specifically about a B2B sales conversation, yeah, they're, they're able to see that there are different, these overlapping filters that are, that, that um, apply to that conversation. There's an external, there's an external uh, component to it. There are, there's an organizational component and there's an interpersonal component. And when I talk about the strategy side, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to use a term that applies to these external dynamics, uh, because I believe that to be helpful to a client, to, to be a legitimate and trusted advisor to a client, you need to have some way of speaking the language of strategy, which is fundamentally about understanding those external dynamics, how the company competes within those dynamics and how they are going to win within those dynamics. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the strategy comes down to two questions, which is where do they compete? And how do they win? And when you understand those questions, um, when you can answer them with respect to your client, then you can have a legitimate strategic conversation about how you can help them win in that environment. So that's what I mean. Yeah, and and um, we, we would agree. I mean, we're we're big on like trying to raise the profile of sales, raise you know, um, you know, the nobility of sales, and people seeing it as a, you know, as a real as a real craft, something that's. That's really meaningful, and I like what you just said there about the strategy because I do think that good B two B good good salespeople are are strategists because you know they're good strategists because they have to pull these pieces together. It's just unfortunate that 
maybe the other people surrounding them sometimes think, well, it's just your strategy is just to try and close business. And you're going, no, it's not. It's actually to really, you know, uncover need and then to 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 see the whole landscape, not just right. uh, see it through a narrow prism. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, people misuse the term strategy quite a lot, quite honestly. And people will just attach the word strategy or strategic or strategic to an otherwise ordinary business initiative in order to make it sound more important than it is. But uh, but strategy is designed to convey something quite particular. It's designed to convey mm -hmm. choices and trade-offs. A, a strategic decision is one that narrows the field of focus, that excludes a bunch of other options because the company and the leadership team have decided that they really want to compete in a very specific space because they have a competitive advantage in that space. And they, they, they have a, a keen sense of what that advantage is. That's what Steve Jobs did when he came in after being away from Apple for several years and he radically rationalized the product portfolio and said, we're gonna be good at just these four things mm -hmm. and we're gonna get really good at simplicity. It was a narrowing of the focus and those are strategic decisions. And to be truly strategic with your client requires you to understand what kinds of choices and trade-offs the client organization has made so that you can talk the language of strategy and you can actually make them successful because the kinds of decisions that are made at the executive level in a company are based on strategy. They're based on mm -hmm. allocating people and resources according to strategic priorities. And unless you can talk that language, you're not really going to be at that table. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think uh, hand in hand with that, uh, you need to be, you know, you need to have a real insatiable kind of curiosity to really dig deep and to, to really to try and understand. Because I think that's what often uh, differentiates between really good strategic salespeople and other people is that level of curiosity, that, that um, appetite to go deeper, understand things on a deeper level. I would agree with that for sure. I, I think in some respects that is the uh, maybe the, the bedrock competencies, uh, competency mm -hmm. of, of, of top performing sellers, because at the end of the day, a seller is is uh, is somebody who is asking smart questions, uh, and I've talked about these three domains. You know, the strategic domain, becoming a strategist, change agent, and decision architect. Mm -hmm. To be successful in those realms requires you to be constantly teasing out more insight, more information, so that you can continue to uh, refine your sense of what is going to help that organization. So you're absolutely right. That, that is that is fundamentally a question of curiosity. Those who have that insatiable curiosity, you know, that drive, are the ones who who continuously improve and ultimately are the most likely to be trusted by their clients. Yeah, and and then the other part obviously is is being very very good active listeners, being very good at validating and making sure they truly understand. You know, when they're having conversations with with um, you know prospects or buying committees or whatever, that they really really understand what's going on and actively listen. And the thing is, let's be honest, Douglas, I, this whole active listening unfortunately seems to be a dying art for a lot of people because they've allowed themselves to become so distracted. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it is. I think the the really it is becoming more and more of a superpower to be able to focus yeah. for yes. a sustained period of time, you know, and, you know, to tie it back to selling selling is there's so many ways to sort of think about the principles of selling uh, and you know another one another framework perhaps is just to think about how selling comes down to preparation you know, those those who sell well are are those who are able to put in the time in order to prepare a robust hypothesis of what is going to be potentially valuable to that client and that requires focus it requires time mm -hmm. setting aside time on a regular basis to absorb some complicated materials about that client and distill the information into some sound bites that are going to travel easily within that organization. That requires work. You know, um, we are yeah. all sketched too thin. We are all oversubscribed. We are all tempted to become more and more superficial in the way that we, we work with clients. But it is, um, that's ironic because uh, in order to prevail, in order to win in this increasingly competitive environment, we need to be able to show that we understand our clients. Otherwise, we're just going to go with the, the another another vendor. Yeah, and it's often you can tell you can tell the top performing salespeople because they do have 
prep time and learning time like blocked off on their calendars or whatever whereas you mm -hmm. see a lot of other people they may have appointments and meetings but you don't see the you don't see the prep time right yeah yeah no it's you know in, in so many respects i've often thought that that you know selling uh, good sellers are they're strategists they're psychologists but they're also really good project managers they're very good about managing their time and their calendar because unless you unless you block off those stretches in order to think deeply about your customers' problems and to continuously feed your pipeline, you're uh, you're not going to be able to deliver over the course of uh, a quarter, much less a fiscal year. Mm -hmm. And so the the part two of your book is about becoming a change agent. So um, just just um, elaborate on on what you mean by change agent in the in the context of sales. Well, a seller is beyond being a strategist, beyond identifying the, the things that to, are going to help that client compete and win, a seller is also trying to uh, identify a pre-existing source of energy and to feed that energy. It's not the responsibility of a seller, it's not good practice for a seller to try to just walk into a client's environment and insist upon their way of doing things and just forcibly bring the client around to that way. Mm -hmm. That's not what uh, a seller does, um, or at least those who do it well. W uh, the top performing sellers, at least what I've seen, is that they they go in and they find out what that pre-existing energy source is, and they find a way to feed it and to nurture it and to enable it in some way. Um, and so it's not a matter of, of getting the client to do something that is fundamentally different. It's getting them to pursue that which is already identified as an important agenda, but to help the client do so, to, uh, to help them do what they were already doing more effectively. And so a change agent is, is doing that. It's, uh, I use this, uh, this analogy of, of selling being more, uh, more similar to chemistry than to physics. You know, in physics, mm -hmm. you put things in your way like a chair, you just sort of remove it out of your way, but that's not the way human beings are treated or should be treated in a sales context. It's rather, it's a matter of chemistry in the sense that it's more like catalysis. You introduce, an element in order to, in order to begin a catalytic reaction, and and, and so in a, in a selling context, what you need to do is to find out what are those personal interests that exist in the organization, what are those social influences that uh, that exist within the organization, what are those structural surroundings. So I use this framework, which is a well-established framework within the change literature of personal and social and structural dimensions, in order to systematically nurture that energy. That you've identified in the client organization. Yeah, and you and you just want to give a brief uh, a brief description of each of those. Sure. Of each of those. Well, I'll, I'll just talk it by way of an example. So yes. there, there was a, there was a colleague of mine who did a particularly spectacular job of this, and she took a, a program that was a very small program in a client organization, and she grew it to a massive program. And she did that over a period of a few months, but it was very much in accordance with this three-part framework of personal, social, and structural considerations. Uh, change, whether we're talking about individual change or whether we're talking about institutional change, it can always be attributed to a proportional emphasis on these three areas. So let me explain. In this particular case, she came in and she identified what was getting airplay in that organization. She figured out what were the what were the most important initiatives that were being talked about at the manager level, mm -hmm. at the executive level, at the, at the company town halls, et cetera. And she, uh, she found a way to attach her solution to that initiative, and to, to make it clear that what she was offering was something that was directly supportive of that, that company-wide agenda. So she found a way to tap into personal interests, both at the executive level and at the, uh, at the ground level. Then uh, on the social dimension, uh, social dimensions are extremely powerful. We, we tend not to do anything unless we receive some kind of a social cue. And this definitely plays out in a corporate context as well. And so she found out, she did some research and she found out who are the most innovative people in this organization? Who are those who are known to be open to and supportive of innovative initiatives? And who are the, the most respected members of that community? And so she found those individuals. She got time in their calendar, having identified and sort of complimented them for their reputation that preceded them. And she built that coalition of people who were interested in doing things differently and sort of pushing the envelope of the organization in order to get them to commit to some you know, early uh, early pilot programs that involved mm -hmm. her. 
Um, so that was a social component. And then the structural component, this is the third piece, it's often overlooked, but that which we are surrounded by structurally, whether we're talking about a physical environment or whether we're talking about a digital environment, that which is part of our everyday reality is something that just becomes more important to us. And so she looked at the structural component. She looked at where mm -hmm. people were spending time in terms of their meeting cadence, in terms of the, the training content that they were consuming, in terms of their CRM environment. And she looked to try to create a surrogate presence for her solution within these different contexts. And so she became a part of the deal review cycle. She became a part of their training experience by having some enablement videos set up in that environment. And so she, she quite deliberately tried to increase her presence within the structural surroundings so that there, there was a greater sense of the importance of her solution. So when those things were combined, you know, all together, the personal interests, the, the, the social influences, the, the structural surroundings, it became sort of a surround sound experience for this organization. So when it came time to propose a much larger program, it was a very, very straightforward and easy conversation for her. Yeah, I know that that's a that's a fascinating story, very very illuminating story, and it it shows how you can create you know the multi dimensional approach as as opposed right. to a unidimensional one. And then the next part, you talk about becoming a a decision architect, and I love that phrase because I do think that today, you know, decision making you know can be quite it can be quite complicated. It can also be quite haphazard at times. So uh, I love the idea of the decision architect. Could you just explain that in more detail? Yeah, well, the whole purpose of this section is to try to bring some of the great thinking uh, from the, the, the realm of behavioral economics into the mm -hmm. world of sales. This has already started to happen to some degree, and I'm just trying to move it along as much as I can. But it's important to understand what behavioral economics is, first of all, in order to understand why it's so important to the sales challenge. For the benefit of those who are not so familiar with behavioral economics, it emerged as a new branch of economics in response to traditional economics, because traditional economics was based on the view that human decisions are rational decisions, that human beings can be viewed as rational agents. And that when you're looking at um, and when you're looking at making predictions for the economy, you assume that people are making decisions rationally. Mm -hmm. That used to be the traditional assumption within economics. Then folks like Daniel Kahneman and Daniel Ariely and some of these folks, Richard Thaler and others who were the, the godfathers of the behavioral economics movement, they came in and they said, this is simply not true. We have evidence to show that it doesn't work like that, that people, that human beings make decisions much of the time based on obviously irrational criteria. Mm -hmm. And what they came up with was a framework for human decision making. And they talked about the degree to which human beings are bound by, they, they, they are subject to these bounds of attention bounds of rationality and bounds of self-interest. And they said, these are the, the boundaries that define human decision-making. And what I believe is that sales, this is directly relevant to sales, because if you think about a sales cycle, essentially what you're trying to do as a seller is you're trying to, first of all, get someone's attention. So you're working within those bounds of attention. Second of all, you're trying to get someone to make a judgment about your product or solution. So you're working within the bounds of rationality. And then third, you're making, you're getting someone to take action. And so you're working within the bounds of self-interest in terms of trying to prompt them to take action. So uh, behavioral economics is really, really interesting and really important in order to understand how to be more sophisticated and how, uh, how to be more informed when we are navigating these bounds. And, and so my section on the decision architect is, is walking through some of the core principles of behavioral economics and, and some some tactical examples of how those are used in, in a sales setting. Yeah, no, that's that's really fascinating because we we would agree with that. I mean, we we subscribe to the you know Austrian school of economics, well, because the the school of economics you're talking about in the Kensins and that is about this predictable you know predictable human behavior, and unfortunately, that has as you said has embedded itself uh, over the years, and that is leads us now to where people think you can build AI solutions for selling and all of that, but they but it it only works in a when there's predictable behavior and it doesn't work and it really doesn't work because people are not predictable as you said right yeah yeah no it's um, uh, you know the uh, uh, no human being is is a machine uh, no organization is is uh, is mechanistic i think we are all um, we're all organic agents and you know the, the the way that organization organizations behave is as a 
uh, you know, an emergent property. So, so uh, I think it's really, really important to understand these subrational forces that, that have such a strong sway over individual mm -hmm. and collective decisions. Yeah, because I think it's really interesting that a lot of people, you know, when you have people who like the ideal buyer persona or whatever and things like that, a lot of that comes from from that uh, from that uh, economic or school of economics that looks at people as like behaving in a particular way all the time. Um, one of the last things I wanted to touch on before we go is in your last section, you know, widening our lens, uh, talking about the tenets of trust. And and you hear about trust and people talk about trust, establishing trust. But I often I feel that people don't really re understand really uh, trust on a more comprehensive level, if you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm fascinated by this this notion of trust. Uh, again, it's one of these words, a little bit like strategy that's uh, used all the time to <laughs> talk about trust. And uh, I, I, I think it was I, I thought it was appropriate to try to pause in that section and try to dissect what 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 is actually uh, meant by that and so i talk about the you know, the, the the three parts of of the trust triad you know, the authenticity capability and empathy uh, and you know fundamentally when somebody when you trust someone it's because you believe you are getting the real version of this person that's the authenticity piece uh, you mm -hmm. believe that this is a you have confidence in this person's judgment and reasoning that's the capability piece and uh, you feel that this person understands you or is paying attention to you. And that's that's the empathy piece. So I think um, what's interesting about each of those dimensions, though, is that they, for someone to be trustworthy, all of those criteria have to be met. And they have to be met in a very proportional way. <laughs> and, you know, it's very easy to imagine a situation where you, someone dials up the, the capability component yeah. too much, uh, you know, and sort of comes on too strong with being a sort of pointy headed know-it-all and 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 therefore loses trust you know someone can even come off come across too much or too strong on the empathy front you know there's too much concern that sort of gives the impression that you're just a little bit naive and maybe not quite attuned to the to the mm -hmm. the, the subtler components of what matters to that person so it's um it's interesting how how trust is a, is a fine balancing act across those three dimensions and you know i, I feel that um what I'm trying to build with this, with this, with this framework in the book of a strategist and uh, and decision architect and um, change agent is I, I'm I'm trying to uh, pay attention to to a very balanced uh, interplay uh, of those three things. Yeah, no, no, I love it. I think it's I think it's fantastic, and I think that's uh, that's one of the pieces that people really really need to to understand on those, those dimensions. Uh, all of Douglas's information is going to be below this video. Uh, but before we go, Douglas, actually bring up your book there so people can see it. Yep, sure, um, here it is. Yeah, <laughs> The Sales MBA, How to Influence Corporate Buyers. Uh, before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Yeah, well, I wear three hats professionally. So my day job is I'm a sales leader at LinkedIn. I lead a team of professionals who are trying to grow LinkedIn's relationship with large enterprises. And my second hat is a teaching hat. So I teach leadership development courses within LinkedIn and, and externally with business schools uh, at the MBA and executive MBA level. And then the third realm is in the startup space. I, I do work with startup accelerators and helping founders develop a better understanding of how to sell their, their products and services to corporate buyers. So those are the three hats. Perfect. Well, listen, thanks again, Douglas. Thank you for watching and listening. And I will see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, John.